if you to look at the, the, the 100 most played Spotify tracks over the past five years, there's a kind of remarkable similarity. These charts are almost entirely dominated by what would have traditionally been seen as electronic music production. If this is taken as a yardstick for contemporary mainstream pop music, and it's a soundscape dominated by drum machines, 1990s inflected synthesizer pads and bass tones, auto-tune, really highly stylized vocal staging, and what would have once been regarded um, as key genre indicators of dance music, such as filter sweeps, um, pumping side uh, chain uh, compression, uh, drops and breakdowns. And as uh, Andrew Reuter was saying in his paper today, a lot of these, these elements which were kind of expansive within dance music have now been kind of distilled into three and a half minute uh, pop tunes. And, and it's become a kind of dominant um, 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 mode within kind of mainstream production. So even the most traditionally rock-based acts that who kind of continually appear in the 100 most played Spotify um, uh, charts, such as people like um, Ed Sheeran, Imagine Dragons, Coldplay, all utilise electronic production styles in order to orientate themselves towards the mainstream market. So what I want to suggest is that this snapshot of uh, contemporary pop popularity is indicative of a new mainstream in which electronic music and electronic production techniques, and in particular, and this is what I want to talk about today, digital audio workstations, have become progressively more central within the creative strategies of the global um, um, popular music market and uh, popular music industry. So Jason Toynbee um, sees mainstream music as a rather self-evident generic grouping, and rather mainstreaming as a, a, a social process, um, whereby um, the music industry utilizes musical text and generic discourses and folds, which fold difference uh, in and articulate distinct social groups together towards an aesthetics of the center, um, a stylistic middle ground. Um, and of course, recording technologies have always been at the heart of this particular process, at the heart of this mainstream tendency. Um, Positioning an artist or a, or a particular type of music towards a mass audience has always been a, a process of using production style to make recordings fit with common institutional expectations, such as radio formatting, and also kind of contemporary audiences' expectations about production. So you know, different production eras uh, have, have, have kind of different styles in terms of popularity. Um, what I think is significant, significant about the, the um, uh, contemporary kind of mainstream is that it's in an era of uh, what I call convergent digitization. Um, so in a, in a 2015 essay, Paul Faberge talks about digitization not being a revolution, but rather an evolution. And in the historical part of the book, I kind of outline digitization as a kind of three-way process. Um, so exploratory, expansive, and convergent. And I won't go into that, I haven't got the time to go into it there, but Basically, convergent by convergent digitization and a period from about the mid 90s when there are significant technological um, um, developments which impact upon kind of social usage and also uh, in terms of in terms of industry. So the mid 1990s seen as the start of a period of convergent digitization with a number of different strains stemming from early advanced digitization com converge upon the singular side of the personal computer. And I think that's significant. That, that pre that period, digitization occurred across differing kind of hardwares. Um, and obviously, leads to things like the onset of web facilitated communication, MP3, file sharing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is vastly increased processing speeds of personal computers in the 1990s, allow for a smooth, simultaneous handling, handling of audio and other tasks in music production. And it's the time when digital audio workstations, or what I call integrated digital audio workstations, start to be kind of based solely within the computer uh, and can handle MIDI and audio at the same time. So everything's done within, so you know, at that time, uh, Cubase starts to be able to handle audio, um, um, Pro Tools begins to handle MIDI. So there's the digital audio workstations become integrated. Um, yeah, and there's an increasing transfer of tasks from hardware to software, and the integration of creative work in the singular site of the person's computer. 
And I think the personal computer has particular modalities which facilitate creative action in particular ways. So, in terms of this process of mainstreaming occurs in this context. Um, I think since the, the, the mid 2000s, this mainstreaming process has taken the form of a hybridization of a number of genres in the context of the digital production environment, facilitated by that. Um, the creative intermediaries that are central in making major pop music have increasingly incorporated the formal and timbral characteristics of electronic dance music into their work, along with a parallel cross fertilization of hip hop, RB, and traditional pop idioms. And it becomes a kind of stylistic mainstream that's, that's become, as I say, kind of predominant. Um, the most commercially successful end of the current market is therefore now dominated by a relatively small number of hybrid songwriting production teams who utilize the DAW in all of their processes in terms of from songwriting um, uh, to final mixing. Um, and the door is now the site of songwriting, tracking, production of significance, uh, and, and production for a significant select selection of cultural producers within the upper echelons uh, of the contemporary pop industry. So the ubiquity of digital production technologies, uh, um, principally the digital audio workstation, has often been read as, as, as in terms of a democratisation of popular music. Um, what I want to suggest here is that there's a need to balance that recognition of the enabling potential of these technologies with an appreciation of how large music companies have used them to uh, reorientate their business models in the light of digitisation establishing new and dominant patterns of creative labour within music production. So, in order to do this, um, obviously I can analyse every track that was um, um, in the past five years from uh, 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 the top of the Spotify tunes. What I did was simply kind of a stick um, measure of the UK pop charts um, in one week and analysed um, the top 30, the top 30 um, tracks. So, who were they produced by, where were they produced, um, which platform were they produced on, um, what type of studio were they produced in, to give a kind of picture of uh, and as I said, one week, but actually it's remarkably similar. If you, if you did this at any stage across the past five years, you would get a very, very similar set of results. Um, the first thing, I guess, to, um, uh, to say is that digital audio workstations are because it's pretty much every single entry to the chart uses them. Also, there's a kind of divergence of the types of platforms used. Um, it just so happened that number one that week was um, uh, Bruno, Bruno Mars' um, um, Uptown Funk, which is kind of unusual in that it uses analog technology and tape technology. It's, it's kind of unusual in the songwriting process in that it was started off with uh, Bruno Mars playing drums, uh, uh, Jeff Basket and Mark Wilson playing jamming out of kind of instrumental funk track, which was done in Bruno Mars' home studio. They went, they, then they did some tracking in um, um, uh, Dunham in Brooklyn, which is quite a kind of famous analog fetishized studio where uh, Amy Winehouse recorded um, um, uh, a lot of kind of retro songs being recorded. So it's, it's, it's known for a very particular kind of thing. Um, but also the, the production programming was done in uh, enormous Los Angeles, which is Jeff Basket Studio, uh, Zelly in London, which is basically um, a room in a um, industrial state behind the King's Cross, um, a project studio um, without really a proper live room. So kind of multiple spaces of production. Um, so number two that week, um, a, a record entirely done in the box by Philip George, um, not even any outboard, much outboard equipment, just control services in uh, the artist and project studio in Nottingham in his parents' house. So kind of a, 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 an example of democratisation there. But what's striking is that, yes, there are large studios being used, so uh, in Dale in London, but even in that context, so that's all the it's obviously got a good budget towards it to see as a kind of priority pop artist. Uh, but working father, working with cut father Daniel Davis and Peter Valerick, uh, uh, who are a Danish production team who work entirely in logic. Um, so all of 
the kind of writing and uh, instrumental stuff, there's, there's, there's real instruments on that as well, but the base of the track was done in the box in logic. And then they did guitar parts, vocal string parts in the larger studios. So it's a kind of, even then, when you've got a large budget and you're using the most large studios in the UK, there's, there's a mixture of things going on there. Um, there's a variety of different platforms used. So Ed Sheeran, one of the most commercially successful um, artists from the UK in the past five years, um, records in Cubase, which you know, generally people wouldn't understand as a kind of industry, uh, industry standard. It's all using Ableton Live to kind of do uh, loops with beats um, and kind of mixture. Uh, and that was done in, in um, Jake Bosman's studio in Surrey which um, uh, actually had worked on his first album, there's certain parts of his second album with this as well. Um, you'll see different names coming up again and again, people like Max Bolling, Superstar Producers. Um, again, kind of EDM, Charlie, using Presona Studio One, in, entirely inside the box, um, um, probably done in airports. And his home studio, and on his way to gigs as a, as, as a DJ, um, yeah, lots of even even things like um, Sam Smith, um, yeah, RFK London, big studio. Um, the way that that was recorded, a lot the kind of initial songwriting was done um, in Jimmy Nave's um, 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 project studio, um, which is not a kind of massively um, 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 expensive setup, but some of the tracking that eventually ends up in the recording, which is already in London, is actually recorded in a dive studio. So, for instance, on um, it's not that track, but stay with me, he uses um, um, this, they did a kind of live drumming track and then chopped it up to the loop. It's actually slightly out of time, but then so the feels really good, let's use that. So again, they're going into a big studio, but they're using pieces of solid material, which has been generated through the digital audio workstation in a variety of different things, different um, contexts. Um, so, um, yeah, Clean Bandit and Jess Glynn, inside the Northern Ableton Live in a porter cabin in Kilburn uh, in North London. Um, okay. Greg Kirsten, who became kind of one of these superstars, worked with Adele, etc. It's a small kind of cabal of um, um, uh, producers that kind of uh, 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 permeate uh, the kind of mainstream charts. Um, one Direction, uh, Julian Bennett and John Ryan, um, Wendy House London, for ages trying to find out Wendy House recording studio. It doesn't exist. It's a dance studio in North London, but mm -hmm. they clearly did kind of choreography. Uh, and John Bonetta went in um, with a mobile recording setup, um, which he used throughout their American tours. Um, a lot of that, um, the, the, the album that came from was done in hotel rooms during the, um, um, during the American tour. So they could maximise on the success of the first album and very quickly put it out the second album. So even as they were promoting the first, they were they were recording the second, but it was the DAW was important that it was kind of expedient in providing a, a, a quick turnover for an act with a fairly limited shelf life. So, yeah, the chart illustrates that DAWs have led to a more dispersed production practice in which the sites of creativity uh, are fluid in terms of time, location, and the types of technology being used. There's not one real industry standard DAW. There's, in terms of that mainstream production, there's different uh, working modes. Um, yeah, so. I think this has a kind of, uh, it shows something about creative practice. So there are different modes of creative practice that are illustrated by this. Um, so the prop production teams that uh, dominate this sample chart in common with uh, many songwriting teams in the contemporary industry tend to cover key aspects of the creative process from beat making, arrangement and top line melodies. They're all undertaken within the DAW environment. 
Um, such teams tend to work, work out of their own studios. Um, so there's a lot of art, art so project studios in here. There's a kind of shift away from big studios to you know, sometimes quite. Um, so, for instance, Steve Robson, who works on Armin Mirrors, uh, he's got a Pro Tools set up um, in, his, in, his, in his studio um, with, a, with, a, with an API box, which is especially. Uh, create a big piece of hardware, which is a recording console especially, especially made, marketed at kind of high-end uh, project studios. So the project studios become kind of ubiquitous in this type of production. Um, so due, due to the nature of contemporary production techniques, they often lack expensively designed or large live rooms, um, and instead they tend to use smaller spaces um, for recording vocals. So, in this mode of creativity, there's a clear elision between production and songwriting, as many of the building blocks of a particular track take place, uh, um, are put in place by the songwriting being undertaken. So a lot of the sonic materials that appear on the, um, um, the end products appear on demo. So for instance, an example of that would be um, so Take This Church, which was a massive hit for, for Hosier, uh, which was done in artist own project studio. So Hosier um, had done kind of demo, um, uh, demos of the song, um, then worked in Sheffield Dublin, which is um, uh, Rob Kerman's studio, which is a, a much kind of bigger setup, but they used a lot of the tracking on, on the on the demo stuff because of the feel, because the, the, the tapes were okay, um, the, the, they didn't want to kind of mess with the formula of the, of the demo, so they kind of carried that through, that interoperability. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the part of hybrid modalities facilitated by DOWs themselves, uh, which I've argued have emerged through digital music production and computing technologies emerging together. Um, through convergent digitization. So as the history of the DAW, or the integrated DAW, is entirely kind of bound up with um, uh, more general patterns in computer human um, uh, interaction. So as the software um, industry more generally um, develops in the 1980s, um, digital audio workstations take up all the logics of computing. Because they're, um, they're working within that. Yeah, so complete inculturation of the DOWs of contemporary recording practice, diversity of application, um, DOWs in a variety of different creative modalities, integration of the songwriting process. Yeah, so in the book, I argue that DOWs develop in tandem with and apart from a wider set of visual and tactile modalities that emerge across uh, personal computing. Um, as Paul was saying yesterday, there is a kind of a, a massive amount of remediation of analog technology within, within digitization. But as an aside to that, the language and the visual affordances of um, uh, computer generated um, um, interaction begin to kind of work their ways into the digital workstations and 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 Creativity, they become important to creativity. So at the end, integrate the everyday affordances of human computer interaction into the creative process of musicians and producers. It changes what it means to be creative, it changes the actual things that people do in order to make music. So, in addition to that, DAWs and related to that are uh, virtual environments which offer particular ways of structuring and creative experiences. And the GUI doors, of course, offer simultaneous visual and sonic performances, and they're very important in terms of the way in which um, action takes place. So, for instance, um, all of these things we can kind of, they might have some analog in the analog recording world, but actually the way that they're realized within the digital audio workstation tends to be about more general patterns of GUI construction. 
um, and that becomes kind of integrated. So layering, freezing, drawing, cutting and pasting, looping, zooming, and doing um, database thinking, they're all kind of general things that you would put in you know, as an app developer, you would want your app to have, right? Because it's understandable from a context of computer human interaction. So if you know how to use Microsoft Word, you kind of know how to use a, a, a photographic um, application. And the same applies, I think, in terms of the gradual integration from the 1980s onwards into digital audio workstations. Um, the, the logics of digital audio workstations. That has a kind of profound effect on the way in which people make music. It's significant. So, for example, um, one of the acts in the, in the chart, Benny Blanco, who sold 100 million records, uh, works either in the project studio located in his New York apartment or in his laptop computer, uh, even, if, even if he has access to a professional studio doing the product. Uh, this is an interview. Um, he comments on the portability of personal computers and software. I don't like big studios, and we usually have a Pro Tools setup in the lounge of the building. So he kind of likes to work in a kind of in, a more intimate, informal kind of setting. Um, he says, sometimes I'll start with a keyboard, sometimes I'll start with drums, which I'll program by dragging and dropping into Pro Tools. I've built up my own sound library over the years, database thinking. Uh, I rarely use samples from the songs unless I need them, and they absolutely cannot recreate. And the sample embodies exactly what I need, but normally I treat, simply treat my own sounds and my own playing as if it was a sample. And that's significant, treating your own playing if you were, as if it's a sample. So playing something in, dragging it, squashing it, looping it, all of those things become kind of important in the nuts and bolts of music creativity. And I think that's, that's a kind of significant, of that historical, significant aspect of that historical entwinement. So crucially, this type of approach is indicative of how trial and error experimentation of the songwriting process often takes place inside and is facilitated by, importantly, the functionality and kind of affordances of the DAW environment. So within this mode of production, there's no clearly defined demarcation between differing elements of creative practice, songwriting and recording, in a sense, become part of the same thing. Um, often demos are worked up in project studios, uh, either with collaborative songwriting partners before being tapped with particular artists or labels. And the interoperability of doors, door environments, allows for a layering of sounds between specific locations. So as, as you saw on the chart, there's lots of different studios which are used in, virtually all of them were, were, were cross-studio productions. Um, so the starting materials that are produced during the initial songwriting process will often appear in finished recordings. So the ability to compose, record, and mix across a variety of different sites points to an increasing flexibility in the production of process which permeates a significant sector of pop production. The DAW allows for a hitherto impossible level uh, of interoperability in which materials that go towards final release recordings have worked, reworked, edited, and finessed efficiently over a number of, number of complementary sites of production. In addition, uh, DAW technologies have facilitated material shifts in the working practices, um, in the working practices um, of um, uh, cultural intermediaries, within, uh, 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 cultural, sorry, cultural producers um, within the sector. Digital technology is central to this type of freelance project-based working in that it allows, that it allows some like producers to capture ideas quickly and efficiently, easily reuse materials, create databases, uh, work on multiple projects at the same time, um, easily compartmentalize between projects, work flexibly according to their own schedules and the schedules of, of the large music companies uh, and major pop performers, and to make pitches to labels and artists through some work production projects that can be worked and changed expediently in response to collaboration and feedback. So it creates a kind of a very particular type of post-digital flexibility in the creative process. This level of dispersal in, in terms of creative activity suggested by the sound in the chart is thus uh, indicative of changes in how we might conceptualize the idea of the studio itself. 
It suggests that the increasing fragmentation of recording practice means that we can no longer think about the recording studio as a singular geographical location where the major facets of production are carried out in one place. Rather, different types of location are used on a task to task basis, basis um, depending on budget. Sure, we're going to wrap up very soon. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Can you conclude this? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so, yeah. What I was going to suggest was that this is kind of a, a knock on effect in terms of the way in which the large music of the companies organize their, their portfolios. So, for instance, um, Keith Meagher talks about in the 1990s. Um, um, differences between kind of, priority acts, cash cows, etc., etc. What this has actually facilitated is, is a, more, a more kind of rapid response change to the market, um, 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 a, um, a concentration on cash cows rather than kind of long term projects, and that it's kind of fundamentally changed like, the structures of the way in which record companies fund and understand the recording process. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, it's my impression, and I'm, I can't really back this up, but it's my impression that more pop producers and voices are using the sequences, the sequence part of the DAWs today. They're using programs like Fulios and Sequence Online that are more based on sequencing than the classic timeline. And it's my impression that, that sequencing is it's more like becoming one place that starts to take Yeah, place. I mean, I think in terms of a lot of, a lot of the, so Ableton's kind of used as a kind of starting off point, which yeah. you then maybe kind of explore into, into something else. So it's kind of, it's very much a creative tool that allows you to kind of get an idea down very, very quickly and easily, uh, and, and to build the basis of a, a, a loop or a beat. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's absolutely right in terms of that trial and error process is done in that way of working. And even in, even in so I've looked at lots of kind of uh, videos of, of um, EDM producers, producers, what they will do is kind of build up a loop. So even if it's not in Ableton, in, in so Logic, they'll get a time, like a square, uh, a, a, and they'll do it over and over again, and they'll work it up to its kind of highest point, and then strip it back down and over the song structure. And so I think, yeah, that, that's absolutely right in terms of, and that's facilitated by the DAW is a kind of creative process, that, that, that's how it becomes kind of part of something. <laughs> hence, the kind of aesthetic implications of the mainstream pop. So I think it's important, but the tools are important, I guess. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.